Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's web conference, the Planning P Part 2. Please note that all participant lines will be muted until the Q&A portion of the call. We will provide you with instructions on how you can ask a verbal question at that time. You're welcome to submit written questions during the presentation and these will be addressed during Q&A. To submit a written question, use the chat panel on the right-hand side of your screen and choose all panelists from the Send To drop-down menu there. And lastly, if you need any technical assistance, please send a note to the event producer. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Liz Clark. Liz, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I'm Liz Clark with Professional Development Services Branch, and I'd also like to thank you for joining us today for the webinar on the Incident Command System Planning Part 2. Our speaker today is Lisa Kiros. Lisa works with the California Department of Food and Agriculture in an emergency response and preparedness capacity. And with that, I'm going to send it over to Lisa. Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking time out today to uh, learn about the uh, planning fee process. Uh, this is the second installment in this uh, webinar series, um, and there will be a third installment on Wednesday. Um, so today I'm going to explain each um, meeting around the planning fee and the prep periods that go with those meetings. Um, we'll go through the forms, and I'm also going to discuss the meeting layouts today. So just to recap from last time, um, we started at the stem of the P and worked our way up, which is uh, down here. This is the leg of the P here. So um, for us, a, a foreign animal disease investigation is initiated when we have some sort of fad suspect. Our response begins with a, either a presumptive positive laboratory result or we may get an imminent disease threat where um, mitigation is necessary, and so we need to do some sort of activity, maybe surveillance or stop movement in our state. Um, the initial response moves up the, uh, the leg of this P once, and then when it, when it gets up here to the very top of this arrow, this becomes a cycle that is continuous throughout the response. So uh, I wanted to discuss the, the planning cycle a little bit. So at the very beginning, as we discussed last time, the field response actions are being documented in a form called the incident brief, incident briefing form, and that's the ICS-201 form. Um, those activities are being executed simultaneously to planning for the next operational period. And what I mean by that is let's pretend like our incident started on June 2nd, and so we did our initial response and assessment, and we produced this 201 form. On June 2nd, when we begin our operational period number one, we are actually executing out in the field those actions and activities that are documented in our ICS Form 201 while we are producing an incident action plan for the next day, which would be the 3rd of June. Then on the 3rd of June, that's our second op operational period, we are executing the plan that we created on June 2nd while we are producing a plan for tomorrow, which would be June 4th. And so this is how the, um, the planning cycle works. We're always looking ahead one operational period and we're planning for that next operational period while we are executing the plan that we developed yesterday or during our very last operational period, depending on what your, um, operational period is. In this example, our operational period would be 24 hours. Okay, so now that we've entered the planning P cycle, we need to establish a meeting schedule. The meeting schedule is the tool that drives the planning process. Um, it is the planning section chief's job to establish the meeting schedule. Um, this schedule should be posted everywhere, on the bathroom doors, uh, at the, on the very front of the, um, the chow line where people get in line to get their food. Um, this should be posted all around your incident command post so people understand when the meetings are and who needs to go to what meetings. So it's the planning section's job to distribute this meeting schedule and make sure everybody knows when the meetings are happening. Uh, this is just a zoomed in view of that schedule. 
One of the things that I think is most helpful about this form is that it lists the attendees that should go to each meeting. I would highly recommend this. It's very helpful for people to understand when they need to be at a certain meeting. And so by listing the attendees next to the meeting name, um, that gives the, the viewer, oh, okay, I need to get that. Oh, I that meeting. Um, <clears throat> What I'd like to say about establishing your meeting times or your meeting schedule is that you should always back your meeting time, you should back into your meeting times by calculating backwards based on when you want to conduct your operations briefing. The operations briefing is what happens whenever you have prepared your incident action plan, then you bring together your, uh, you know, your leaders and your group supervisors and your branch directors from the ops section, and you brief them on the incident action plan for uh, for the next operational period. That operational briefing, if you want to conduct that in the morning, then you need to have your incident action plan done in the evening before. If you want to conduct your ops briefing late in the evening after people have come in from the field, then you would need to work on your, your incident action plan and have it finished, you know, an hour or so before you want to do that briefing. So you always want to back into your meeting times based on when do you want to get your ops briefing done. <clears throat> Later on during the incident when resource ordering process becomes more um, streamlined um, and regular, um, the meeting times can, you know, the the meeting times can flux, but at the very beginning when you still have a lot going on, you want to leave a few hours between the tactics meeting and the planning meeting to give the logistics section time to confirm resource orders. You want to give the ops section a little bit of time, maybe an hour or two, between the command and general staff meeting and the tactics meeting because they need to get their plan together. They need to write their 215 and understand where they're going to use their resources the next operational period. So you can see how if you back in from the ops briefing and then you allow a few hours between this meeting and a few hours between that meeting, it kind of helps you set your schedule. Later during the incident, when resource ordering becomes more streamlined, maybe you have a regular cutoff times for like, you know, you start ordering resources weekly rather than daily, um, then, you know, those times can be a little more fluctuated. But initially, when your ordering has to be done daily and your incident is just ramping up, uh, in order to get out ahead of the response, you have to have, you know, these meetings a lot more regularly so that everyone's on the same page about how many resources need to be ordered and what's the, what the jobs are that you're going to get accomplished out in the field. Okay, so this is the first um, meeting that starts the cycle. This cycle um, goes on every operational period, as I said, um, and so the Unified Command Objectives Meeting, um, the purpose of the meeting is to set response priorities, identify limitations and constraints, uh, develop incident objectives and establish guidelines for the incident management team to follow. So traditionally, this meeting is the two incident commanders, maybe one from the state and one from the federal government, uh, USDA, get together and they confirm their agreement on joint objectives. They confirm their agreement on um, the joint strategies. If they've received any constraints or limitations from their agencies, they talk about those. Um, the Unified Objectives Meeting um, helps develop the ICS-202 form, which is um, a form that goes into the Incident Action Plan, so we'll talk about that. Um, during this meeting, the incident commanders will often draft a list of open actions, which are tasks that are assigned to incident staff who are not part of the operations section. Um, one example might be if you need the uh, public information officer to set up a town hall meeting in some, some place. That would be not something that the operations people are handling. It's some other position in the incident camp. It's a big task and you want to track it. Um, you can use an open action tracker, which is the ICS uh, Form 233. And we'll talk about that in, uh, in a little bit. So these are the people who have sort of a role in the objectives meeting. The incident commanders are going to develop their incident objectives 
Again, those are recorded on the ICS Form 202. The incident commanders have um, discussed or talked about um, incident priorities. Um, there is an ICS form for that. It's the 202A, and I'll go over that in a, in a few uh, slides. Um, they identify limitations and constraints. They're going to identify any key procedures or processes and protocols that they're using. Um, they should define critical information requirements. Um, that can be recorded on an ICS Form 202B, and we will discuss uh, further in detail what uh, like. Um, they also need to develop tasks for command and general staff. That's the open action tracker I just talked about, and those should be recorded on the ICS Form 233. In addition, the incident commanders are agreeing on division of workload for themselves. So you have two incident commanders. You don't want them stepping all over each other. You agree, okay, I'm going to handle this, and you're going to handle that type of thing. <clears throat> so each operational period, the incident commanders will use this meeting to revisit their objectives. Um, during At the very beginning of a response, this meeting really should be more formal and they should get together and really go through those objectives. As you get down into the response and everything becomes more um, like a well-oiled machine and everything's got sort of a rhythm to it, you know, I've seen incident commanders do this by phone. I've seen them pass their objectives back and forth through email. So you can be creative about how you get these meetings accomplished. But at the very beginning, it's helpful to um, – it's helpful to have them really meet in advance and um, and settle on their objectives for what they want to get accomplished in the next operational period. That's really what we're looking at here. As we go through this planning cycle, we're planning for the very next operational period. We're really not necessarily looking out farther than that. We're just saying, what can we get done in the next 12 hours or 24 hours, et cetera. Um, I want to say here, often the incident commanders will have a conference call with the multi-agency coordination group, um, which may be consisting of their agency administrators from the lead agencies um, prior to this objectives meeting. That ensures that they have talked to their agencies and they know exactly what the direction, the priorities are before they walk into this objectives meeting. So that's something that if you don't usually schedule those conference calls, you should, and it would be helpful to incident commanders to have those calls with their agency administrators just before the objectives meeting so they can take in consideration those discussions when they're setting their new objectives. So the planning uh, section chief often facilitates and the planning section helps to document this meeting. And the planning section can also help propose draft objectives to the incident commanders if they need that level of help. So here's the, the meeting layout. This is what this objective meeting looks like. If your situation is constantly changing, it's a very good idea to have the situation unit leader come in, provide a quick briefing or update of the situation to the unified commanders. Here you can see that there are four incident commanders from four different agencies sitting at this side of the table. Um, the planning section chief is facilitating this meeting. They have their list of open actions here. You see the documentation unit leader here is helping to document this, this meeting. So um, this gives you a good idea of what this objectives meeting might look like. There are agendas for these meetings. Um, in our state, we kind of look to the Coast Guard. They have some very good practical um, handbooks and manuals and agendas for these meetings, but Fire Service also has agendas for these meetings. FEMA has them. You can find agendas for all these meetings uh, just about anywhere. Um, let me go on here. Okay. So now I'm going to kind of talk about some of the forms that get completed either during the, the meeting or, or directly following the objectives meeting. So the outcome of the objectives meeting should be that they've documented objectives, the incident commanders. Those objectives need to be recorded on this ICS-202 form. 
So the purpose of the incident action, uh, of the incident objectives is that they describe the basic incident strategy objectives. Um, and then here you also have some key decisions, command priorities, and safety message that's included on this form. Um, you, uh, people use this form in various ways. Uh, sometimes we've put our planning meeting um, schedule here. We've put our schedule of when we produce the incident action plan and the situation report in this uh, box down here, sometimes box number four here. Um, so <clears throat> you can put in there just about whatever you, you'd like, but in general, usually people document a safety message here. You usually um, document some sort of priorities that the incident commanders have set for your incident and then any key decisions that they've agreed upon. You know, maybe they're not going to do surveillance in some certain area because it's too unsafe for workers, and so they would document those key. All completed forms should be given to the documentation unit. The documentation unit is responsible for creating the official documented records for the incident, and so every form that is completed on the incident should go over to the documentation unit to be archived. And so at any given time during the incident, you should be able to ask the documentation unit to give you the incident action plan from two weeks ago, and they should have them all archived and be able to pull that up for you and get you a copy. This 202 form, again, is part of the incident action plan. <clears throat> this is the 202A form. Um, we actually borrowed this form from the Coast Guard. This form is not traditionally part of your incident action plan, but it does give you a, a location, like a, a, a larger, more, uh, a larger area to document any key decisions and procedures that you're using, priorities, and any limitations and constraints. So if you received your agency administrator briefing and you have a delegation of authority, you're the incident commander, the agency administrator may have given you specific limitations and constraints. They may have emphasized certain priorities that they want you to get done. So a lot of the information out of the delegation of authority can be shared with your um, incident management team through documentation on this form, which is the 202A. Um, and so uh, the planning section chief can help to prepare this form for the incident commanders, and you can revisit it during the next operational period as your incident becomes more mature and you start getting a better idea of where disease is and where it isn't. Your key decisions and procedures might change. Some of your constraints may, may change. Um, you may have different priorities, and so you would want your incident commanders to revisit this every time, and this is a good, this is why you would want to establish that at least once daily communication with the agency administrators so that you can get their take on new priorities, limitations, and constraints as well, and make sure the incident commanders can articulate those uh, down to the incident management team. Okay, this is the 202B form. Again, this is another Coast Guard form that we borrowed. Um, one of, the, one of the key things about this form, forms is um, it really talks about reporting thresholds, like when should people report to you some activity or action or incident that's been taken place. Um, this form is not part of the incident action plan, but it can be completed later on during the response when you have more staffing and you're, you're you know, better organized. Um, some of this information that's listed on this form you know, all incident management team members should report any fatalities or injuries requiring medical attention beyond first aid to the incident commander. That seems like common sense, but common sense isn't always that common. And I know that's a joke, but long hours, stressful days, having stuff written down is always better to get people's compliance. And so um, any reporting, you know, if you want to know if you want your field people to report media or activist activity in proximity to their work assignments, you don't want them to wait till the end of their shift to report that. You want them to report that immediately. And so you document it here and it reminds you to brief your field staff on those um, things that are priority to you and those things that you want them to um, report 
um, to report immediately. Um, maybe the operations section chief has their people check in every two hours or four hours to report work progress, progress. But if they have finished their work for the day, you don't want them to wait four hours to tell you that. You want them to tell you immediately so you can reassign them to do some other work, maybe. And so these are the areas where you would um, document those critical reporting um, requirements. Um, this is prepared by the planning section chief, um, and it is revisited each operational period. Um, you may or may not need to change these each operational period, but you should at least look through them and make sure. And again, the original forms and documentation um, need to go to the documentation unit. So um, another form that is uh, prepared after the objectives meeting is the 233 form. That is the incident open action tracker. tracker. Um, often the incident commanders will develop their uh, list of tasks at the objectives meeting, and they can use this form to assign and track the tasks throughout the, the incident. Um, the open action tracker kind of has it just looks like a spreadsheet. It tells you what the task is and who it's assigned to and when you want to get that accomplished by. Um, it allows the um, incident commanders and section chiefs to review this open action tracker in written format so that those tasks don't get forgotten. And so the incident commander doesn't have to walk around thinking, oh, i got to tell that person this. Well, written down, they can let it go out of their brain and move on to something else. So um, we find that this is really helpful for us um, to get the, the tasks written down, and that way you know they somebody's working on them. So during the um, next meeting, which is the Command and General Staff meeting, is where you will actually take the tasks to the appropriate sections or staff to update those um, to get started on those tasks. Um, and so the planning section um, is responsible for maintaining the open action tracker. This is just a, an example of that form. I wanted you to see it looks just like a spreadsheet. So you have the item here, the point of contact or the person it was assigned to. Um, you have an X in this box if you've already briefed the person and they know that, they're, that they need the assignment. You have many tasks here that have been, been added, but they haven't briefed the person and told them that they've been assigned that task. You assign a start date, um, you assign a target date, and then you can complete an actual date when it's uh, finished. And then during the meetings, you can discuss status where everybody is on that specific task. Okay, so here we are at the Command and General Staff Meeting. So the Command and General Staff Meeting is where the incident commanders who, you know, the in the last meeting, only the two incident commanders and the planning section were present, and they're just documenting all of the tasks and all of the objectives for the next incident, uh, for the next operational period. Now, this meeting, the incident commanders are going to bring the rest of the section chiefs and the command staff together, and they're going to actually make the assignments. They're going to talk through the objectives, what they want to get accomplished in the next operational period, and they're going to assign those open action tasks to the appropriate people, and they're going to discuss any um, activities that are happening out in the field now, has anything changed um, in the situation, et cetera. Um, so the incident commander is responsible for reviewing the key decisions, priorities, constraints, limitations, objectives, and procedures, if you have documented all those things. Um, they also present, present functional work assignments to the Command and General Staff. That should come from the open action um, items. Uh, they, re they review the status of any open action work assignments from a previous meeting. So if they had already assigned tasks, they get a status update from those people that were already assigned tasks. Um, sometimes we can in, in, engage an industry agency representative here. Um, and they can provide some input on strategies from the industry perspective. If industry has a bunch of resources that you need to use, maybe they have pieces of equipment, maybe they have um, notification systems, you know, if they have some element of the tactic or strategy that you expect them to help with, 
then we can, this might be a good place for you to bring the agency reps in to discuss um, how they can commit their resources to help the response. Um, and this is not always comfortable for everyone. You have to use your own judgment and decide what your agency prefers. But this is one way to engage someone from industry or several people from industry, maybe larger industry groups where they can represent, you know, their industry as a whole. Um, but this may be a way to engage industry and get some advice on how, how do they usually depopulate their animals or what do they usually do when they have to dump milk or whatever. Um, they can give some, some advice in those areas. Industry people are going to understand their production cycle, their technical information, their known commercial operations in the area, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't want to lose out on gaining information from industry. There's a lot that we can learn from them that can help us respond more quickly to an event. And so um, you should be, if you don't want them to come to your formal meetings, you should have some way to communicate with industry and gather some of this information. So during these, this command and general staff meeting, the operations section provides an update on current operations, like what's actually going out on out in the field right now. The planning section facilitates and documents this meeting. They also set up the meeting room. That means that if they needed to set up GIS maps, um, print agendas, if there are any handouts, um, it's the planning section's job to reproduce handouts and get things, um, posters hung up on the walls, et cetera, et cetera. A uh, situation a unit leader will come in and provide an update on the current situation. Um, so ops can tell you what's happening out in the field today, but situation will provide you an update on what's happening incident-wide, right? So maybe there's some public affairs things going on. Maybe there's other agencies through the liaison officer situation was told that this other agency is going to come in and help. So ops only knows what's happening out in the field, so they're giving you a current update on operations out in the field. Situation is giving you more of a global view of what's going on. It's and so those are two different reports. And so the documentation unit leader, again, should be helping to document this meeting and help to distribute meeting materials. Here's what your meeting layout looks like. Again, um, during this meeting, you have a lot more participants. You see you have the public information officer, liaison officer, safety officer. You have the incident commanders. You have ops section chiefs. Logistics Section Chief, Finance Section Chief. In the purple box there, that's, that's our industry agency rep. Again, that is an optional person if that is some uh, representation that you want to include. Uh, the Situation Unit Leader can come in, provide their briefing, and leave. Often our Situation Unit Leader stays because they may learn more information about the situation during the um, operation section briefing, and so we don't want them to miss out on any information. So we often have that person stay. Planning section chief should facilitate this meeting. Um, here is, at the bottom here are listed observers. Um, I, we generally do not have observers during our meetings, um, but if you did have an observer, you would want to make sure and clear that by the um, incident commanders before you would allow anyone to observe your meetings. Um, also, um, in the past we have had like maybe the local ag commissioner come in or the county sheriff or the county um, emergency operations center person. Um, if they do come in and observe, it's just something that you need to uh, make sure that everybody knows about and you would probably want to recognize at the very beginning of your meeting, hey, we have some observers and have them state their name and their, their affiliation with whatever their organization is so that everybody in the room gets an understanding of who's in the room with them. Um, let's see. Okay, so there's a couple of other forms now that go along with this uh, command and general staff meeting. Sometimes the command and general staff meeting is called the strategy meeting, and that is um, the objectives are shared and so then we can talk through, you know, you have an objective to depopulate. There are many different strategies you can use to depopulate um, 
animals. So you would take one strategy, let's say if you were talking about, you know, turkeys or, or birds, you're going to use foamers and a foaming crew, that's one strategy. You could use, you know, CO2 in containers, that would be another strategy. And then whenever we get into the tactic, we really are talking more specifically about how we are going to use the foamers, which foamers, which crews, um, how many personnel do we need to get that done, which barn or house do we start in first. Um, are we going to have uh, government foaming teams, or is that going to be contractor teams, et cetera, et cetera. So when we get beyond the strategy into the tactic, we're really getting more granular and more specific about how are we going to execute that one strategy that we selected. This um, 234 form provides the operations section chief um, a tool to convert the incident objectives into different strategies and then to take their desired strategy and really work it down into the granular tactic. Um, this is also helpful for contingency planning. So if you are the ops section chief and you decide you're going to use foamers and then the foamers break down, what's your plan B? Right? If you filled out this form and you went through and you documented three or four strategies for how to depopulate the turkeys, then you would have a fallback strategy already talked about, then you could be ready to implement that very quickly. So that's what this form is about. It's, it's called a workload analysis matrix, um, and it's, it's really used for the operations section chief to turn the objectives into an operational plan and to brief the incident commanders on that plan during the planning meeting. Um, this form is very helpful to discuss with your incident commanders what your contingency planning would be so that you can go to plan B strategy, plan C, and what have you. This is another Coast Guard form, by the way. Okay. So this is the ICS form uh, 234. Again, this is the workload analysis matrix. This is a little bit more of that form. I wanted you to be able to see that there are multiple strategies for each objective. And so when you have an objective like initiate surveillance plan, then you, know, you, you set up your strategy and then you have multiple tactics, um, more you know, very, very detailed tactics about what you're gonna do about those strategies. Um, I realize that this is very, very advanced. Like when you are first responding, some of this stuff just is on the back of a napkin or on a post-it note. I, I get that. Later on during the response, it's helpful to have a form to put this in so you can be more organized. At the very beginning, certainly the action and activity out in the field is more important than just writing the stuff down on the form. I get that. So, um, you know, you, you have to be practical. You have to do what works in the heat of battle. But the closer you can get to being organized to document all your strategies like this, the better the outcome will be. And so this is just a tool that can be used. Not everyone uses this work analysis matrix tool, but it is a very good tool if people are going to start uh, trying to document their contingency planning and really working through all the strategies. Another reason why this is helpful is during the Commander General staff meeting, the incident commanders can help you work through strategies. You know, you can take a minute and talk through, okay, what are the acceptable strategies for depopulating these herds? And you can talk through what the strategies might be. Then ops can take that back to their section and work through tactics on their own. So um, again, here you can see this bullet. It says following the, op following the meeting, the operations section chief will develop the assignments necessary to support the strategy and achieve um, the operational objective. In addition, you may also um, be needing to implement multiple strategies at the same time. So you might not just be able to use one depopulation method. You might need to implement multiples. And if that's the case, this is a good way to document the multiple strategies that you are um, using to achieve the objective. Okay, this is another uh, 
you know, we've moved on from the Santa General Staff meeting. Now we're at preparing for the tactics meeting. Um, remember whenever I said when we're setting our schedule, we want to make this time period about an hour or two hours to allow the um, ops chief to get their marching orders of their objectives from the Command and General Staff meeting and to actually work on their operational plan and come up with tactics. So this time period of preparing for the tactics meeting should be probably two hours or even more if you can give that much time. Um, the more time the operations section chief has to develop their plan, the better. And they can also be checking out in the field with their personnel to see what's getting accomplished so they know what's still going to be on the agenda for tomorrow. So um, during this time frame, the operations section is reviewing their strategies and developing their tactics. They may be selecting a primary strategy and a secondary strategy. Um, they should also be developing some of their alternatives and contingency strategies. They should, they should feel confident that they need to order resources to implement a con contingency. If they really feel like they need to rely on that contingency, they should go ahead and try to order resources and have them staged so that they can implement a contingency just in case. Um, if you have resources to be able to do that, not everybody has that many resources, I get that, you have to be practical and realistic. But if you can um, get some of those uh, resources ordered for the contingencies, you'll be in better shape to be able to carry out your whole objective. Um, the operations section during this time really should be working on their 215 form. That is the work assignment form and they need to actually begin thinking about their operations section organization for the next operational period. If you have ordered, you know, 15 teams of 20 each, that's a lot of personnel that's coming in. You probably need to order a couple of group supervisors or some um, branch directors to help divide up the work and maintain span of control. And so you want the ops section chief to be thinking about how they want to organize their section during the ops section, I mean, during the next operational period. Um, the safety officer during this time should also start developing their 215A, which is the safety and hazard analysis. So for every tactic that's listed on the 215 form, there's a hazard analysis or safety analysis that's listed on the 215A form. And I'll show you that form coming up here. Okay, so during this time of preparing for the tactics meeting, the planning section needs to be setting up the meeting room. Again, maybe they have a more updated GIS map that needs to go up. Maybe they want to do a poster size 215 form and hang that up so that they can work through the process. Um, the planning section will um, facilitate the, the tactics meeting, so if they need agendas or whatever, um, they need to make sure that they have those on hand. They also facilitate the planning process. So. All of this preparedness, they may need to check in with the ops chief. Hey, are you going to be ready for tactics if we have it at 1 o'clock? Maybe they need to push the meeting back a half an hour and give ops some extra time. So it's the planning section's job. The planning chief needs to check with everyone and make sure they're going to be ready for tactics and the, the process is going smoothly. Um, the planning section should review those incident objectives and agree which of those objectives are the responsibility of the operations section. Um, they should ensure that tactical field observer resources are sufficient to meet the incident commander and unified command key information requirements. Um, sometimes operations gets so, so, so busy getting their tasks done that you can't get information for the situation report out of ops quickly enough to meet the incident commander's requirements. If that's the case, you may need to employ field observers. Field observers um, can report directly to the planning section. They can go out, check out the situation, get some intelligence that can be added to the situation report, and report back to the incident, com incident command post so that we can keep our situation reports as updated as possible. Obviously, during a disease response, we want to make sure that those field observers are not creating a biosecurity hazard. So you need to make sure that you're, that, that person is understands biosecurity, understands what the requirements are, and they are medically cleared and fit tested if they plan, intend to go on to any of the infected premises. Um, 
the planning section also ensures any technical specialists are included in, in, the, in the planning process and um, that those technical specialists understand what we need them to contribute. So, um, for instance, if we need some wildlife services advice because we have, you know, uh, swine or some sort of other wildlife that is interfacing with the um, animal agriculture, that is something that the planning section would need to identify and work through the liaison officer to reach out to the appropriate agencies to get those technical specialists activated and into the incident command post so that they can provide advice or guidance or maybe they conduct simultaneous activities along with our incident management teams. Um, and then the, um, the planning section is also responsible for obviously situation information and incident complexity information. Um, the um, incident complexity analysis takes into consideration things like um, the public perspective of the incident, how quickly are you able to keep up with new cases, um, what are the political ramifications of what's going on, are there international trade situations. So all of this, the things at the higher strategic level of the incident that make it more um, higher complexity, those, those are the things that the planning section is trying to keep up on and they would work with the incident commanders to revise the incident complexity analysis if needed throughout the process so that that information gets captured about those elements and how they are changing throughout the process. So I said the, um, the ops section chief is working on their ICS 215 form. This is what the form looks like. It looks kind of like a big spreadsheet. Um, in uh, box four over here, you can see that this is the division group or other location. This is the organizational chart element that the operations section chief is going to assign this work assignment, which is in box five, um, to. So the depopulation group in box four there is going to depopulate by foam. That's the work assignment. They need six contract foaming crews and they need one government foaming crew to get that done. They have zero contractor crews and they have one government foam crew. So they need to order six contract foam crews and they will not order any government foam crews because they already have the one that they need. This is how this form works. So during this time between the Savannah General Staff meeting and the tactics meeting, the operations section chief should start working through this form and documenting the individual work assignments for every organizational element that falls underneath the operations section. Even if they don't have this organizational element, like let's say they don't have a surveillance group activated on their org chart, but next operational period they need to start surveillance, so they're going to put down here surveillance group. They're going to de decide what the work assignment is for that group. They're going to order the resources. And then over here under overhead, which is box seven there, they will order one group supervisor for surveillance so that they can activate that organizational element in their org chart next operational period. Okay, with that, I've shared about 45 minutes worth of information with you. I'd like to leave it open for questions. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you've got a question on the phones, you can press pound two to enter the verbal question queue. You'll hear a notification when your line is unmuted, and at that point, you'll be able to state your name and question. Or you can send a chat question to all panelists using the chat men menu on the lower right-hand side of your screen. And no questions at the moment, but I'll just remind everyone once more, it's pound two to enter the verbal question queue on the phone lines, or you can submit a chat question to all panelists. Okay, and while we're waiting for questions, I'll just say one thing, which is, so I took you through the um, preparing for tactics meeting. Um, during the next webinar, which is on Wednesday, we will go into the tactics meeting and then preparing for the planning meeting, the planning meeting and the ops briefing. So I will continue the planning cycle uh, next time we're, we're on. So we do 
have a written question. Um, can you expand on the general ground rules of the C&G staff meeting? Yes, so ground rules are any rules that you want to set up for your, um, for your planning meeting. So um, you, if you don't want people to be late because that wastes everybody else's time, then you set that as a ground rule. You don't, you know, people don't show up late. People should put their phones on vibrate. People should take phone calls out in the hallway, not around the table. Um, side conversations need to be um, tabled and taken at another time. You're going to use a parking lot. If people get off the agenda, you you know, you know write their idea or their thought on a parking lot, and if there's time at the end of the meeting, you can revisit the idea. Those are kind of the way that ground rules work. You're just kind of setting up the, the ground rules for the meeting. It sounds, like this, it sounds like those are such common sense and very simple, but when you are working for 40, 50, 60 days straight, and you have you know 12 hour days, People, you know, common sense isn't common anymore at that point. People get fatigued, and so they don't remember to put their phones on vibrate every time they walk in the room. So it's something that you do need to remind people of. So we have one comment. This is great info. Thanks for all the insights. Um, another question is, is there software that coordinates all these forms, or are they just a packet of forms? I believe there are software services out there that provide um, these forms. I personally, we use um, we use Coast Guard forms. We use them in Word format or Excel on some of the spreadsheet looking ones, and uh, we find that that works best for us. We um, PDF them at the end of the operational period once we've completed our incident action plan and we, we put all the forms together into one sort of report. Um, we PDF them before we distribute them out to anybody who needs to receive the incident action plan. Um, but we don't use a software service, but there are plenty of, of them out there. That and I do have another question about whether or not they can get a copy of your presentation. Yes, yeah, sure. I will uh, make sure that it's available to you. Okay. Yeah, if you send it to me, I can get that out to who, who asked. Okay. Are there any other verbal or written questions at this time? There are no questions on the phone lines at the moment. So I did get um, someone sent in. Uh, most of the forms can be found at um, HTTPS uh, training.fema.gov. Um, yes. So that would be a great resource to find these forms. Yep. So if we don't have any other questions, um, I would like to remind you again on Wednesday, uh, Lisa will be back with us to uh, finish up her presentation on the Planning P Part 3. And on Thursday, May 3rd, uh, Dr. Jonathan Zach and Dr. Fred Bourgeois will be presenting the second resource webinar on familiarizing personnel with the procedures for ordering personnel and vaccine resources during an emergency response. So hopefully you will all be able to join us for that. And if we don't have any other questions, then I just want to wish everybody, hope you all have a great day, and thanks again, Lisa. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, everyone, for uh, your time today. Thank you to our speakers and thank you all in the audience for joining us. The call has concluded and you may disconnect.